Committee will come to order. These microphones are more sensitive than ours. Um, throughout the year, the committee has examined a number of aspects of American national security. Today, we step back and consider part of the why. Why should the U.S. insist on having the strongest military in the world? What is the connection between a strong military and other instruments of national power and influence? How does a strong military benefit the daily lives of average Americans? As we rightfully work through the details of military threats and capabilities, those are the kinds of questions that we do not often ask, much less answer. Posing them does not diminish the central purpose of the military to protect the physical safety of Americans and defend our freedom against those who threaten it. But there are other benefits that flow from military strength to the American people and the quality of our lives. Today on the floor, we have the opportunity to do something we have not done in nearly a decade, which is to adequately fund the military on time. But one year's budget does not repair the readiness problems that have developed over the years, and it does not adequately respond to adversaries threatening our superiority in several areas. We need a sustained policy, one we stick with even as political currents wax and wane. Such a policy requires looking at these deeper questions of why military strength is important. For more than 70 years, the dominant view in both political parties has supported American military superiority. Many of the underlying reasons, which were learned at a high cost, have come to be taken for granted and are even being challenged at both ends of the political spectrum. Perhaps we need to be reminded of what's at stake. I welcome our distinguished witnesses, both of whom can provide valuable perspectives on these issues. I also want to thank Chairman Goodlad and the Judiciary Committee for loaning us the use of this room while ours is being worked on. Unfortunately, the loan expires at noon, so we will uh, try to get to as many members and questions as we have uh, time before then. Let me yield to the distinguished acting ranking member, the gentlelady from California, Ms. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for bringing this important topic forward today. I also want to welcome our witnesses, Dr. Inbuddin and Dr. Brands, and thank them for appearing today, and request unanimous consent to submit the ranking member's statement for the record. Without objection. You know, Mr. Chairman, we continue to need a whole of government approach to adequately support national defense. Although defense budgets have increased, and the national defense strategy talks about prioritizing alliances and partnerships, the administration has not committed adequate resources to support diplomacy and development efforts abroad. The budget also failed to support domestic priorities that bolster defense long term. Defense innovation can spur growth and major acquisition programs can create jobs, but so too do essential and much needed investments in education and in infrastructure, research and innovation, energy solutions, healthcare, the workforce and many others. Congress needs to sufficiently support the full spectrum of defense and non-defense priorities. Defense spending should be based on a realistic strategy and supported by rational budgetary choices. We need to take a close look at our investments and to take actions that will yield savings and raise revenues. We must invest wisely when it comes to national security and we must be realistic in matching strategic objectives with our finite national resources. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to receiving our witnesses' testimony. Thank you. Our witnesses today are Dr. William Inboden, Executive Director and William Powers, Jr. Chair at the Clements Center for National Security and the Lyndon B. Johnson School Associate Professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and Dr. Hal Brands, Henry A. Kissinger, Distinguished Professor, School of Advanced International Studies, Johns Hopkins University, and Senior Fellow, Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. Without objection, both of your full written statement will be made part of the record. Thank you again for, for being here. Dr. M. Bowden, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Congresswoman Davis and other distinguished members of the committee. It's an honor to be here with you today. I'm gonna to focus my spoken remarks around uh, three main points, all of which I develop in more detail in my written testimony. These three points are 
First, the threats to the international order posed by revisionist great powers, Russia and China. Second, the role that the United States played in creating this order and continues to play in sustaining it. And third, the ways in which a strong military enhances our diplomatic and economic policies. So first, in our present moment, this international order is beginning to erode under growing stress and strain uh, as revisionist powers such as Russia and China seek to undermine or even overturn the American-led order. While increasing numbers of voices in the United States uh, and in Europe take for granted the benefits of the order while questioning the cost, value, and viability of maintaining it. As Robert Kagan observes in his new book, world order is one of those things people don't think about until it is gone. The good news is this world order is not gone yet, but it is decaying inside and imperiled outside. However, we should not lump Russia and China together for, uh, for the nature of their threats is different. Russia is largely a declining power with a host of internal demographic, political, and economic pathologies and very few allies or friends. Vladimir Putin does not have a positive vision for constructing a new international order. He only seeks to play the role of the arsonist with the current order, while reasserting Russia's seat at the high table of international politics and trying to edge the United States aside. Thus, his efforts to undermine European unity, sow chaos and destruction in the Middle East, threaten Russia's near abroad border states, and foment division here in the United States. In contrast, China is an ascendant power that seeks to become the dominant hegemon in Asia while extending its influence across the Eurasian landmass and into Africa and Latin America. China's ambition appears at once more subtle but also more grandiose. It seeks to confine the American-led international order just to the Western Hemisphere while building a new China-led order based on mercantilism, regional tributary states, and rules set and enforced by China designed to benefit only China. This seems to be the strategic vision animating things like the Belt and Road Initiative, its belligerent island construction and base building in the disputed territories of the South China Sea, its flouting of international human rights and religious freedom standards, forced technology transfer and theft of intellectual property rights victimizing many American companies, and then its ongoing information operations inside the United States and other free nations. So second, uh, the second point about the role of America's national defense, uh, our military, in countering these threats and preserving the best of the current international order. I think we need to appreciate that the current order is not self-sustaining or self-regulating. It's a product of American leadership in creating it and a strong military in helping to maintain it ever since, along with diplomacy development and other instruments of national power. And if that leadership is abandoned, whether through damaging cuts to our defense budget or through policy choices to neglect our allies and pull back from international leadership, then hostile actors such as Russia and China will only have more latitude to fill the void in ways that are harmful to our national interests. Many of us look back with appropriate nostalgia on America's vision and leadership during and immediately after World War II on the signature diplomatic and economic initiatives that, uh, initiatives that established the pillars of the international order. Things like the Bretton Woods Agreements, the creation of the United Nations, uh, the Marshall Plan, the creation of NATO, the reconstruction of Japan and Germany, and the web of mutual defense treaties that placed the United States at the geopolitical center of the free world with a network of allies really unsurpassed in world history. It was a very unique moment. But in recalling this history, we should not forget that without America's military might, these institutions would not have been, uh, been possible. Uh, and that was included our military's role, of course, in defeating the Axis powers in World War II, but also helping to deter Soviet aggression in the, in the immediate post-war years. So today, a robust effort to protect, reform, and restore the international order will depend, of course, on American diplomatic prowess and economic dynamism, in addition to committed involvement by our allies, old and new. But doing so will also depend on renewed American military strength undergirding our diplomacy and economic engagement. Our military power provides the security and enabling environment for diplomatic and economic progress to, to take place. And this is where we need to appreciate how the rest of the world looks at American power. From our vantage point here, we often think about American power uh, uh, differentiated into military, diplomatic, economic, across our interagency and reflected in different congressional committees. But when other countries look at American power, they see it more as a unified whole. So when a foreign minister or a finance minister sits across from our Secretary of State or Secretary of the Treasury, they are seeing American power manifested in, in all of its different dimensions, uh, sitting right behind the, the Secretary's proverbial, proverbial shoulder. And this gets my uh, final point about the role that our military power plays in uh, projecting our, our national power in the, in the current context. 
um, five years ago when testifying before the other bodies, Armed Services Committee, then CENTCOM Commander, now Secretary of Defense, General James Mattis, made a memorable plea for the State Department's budget. We all know it. If you don't fund the State Department fully, then I need to buy more ammunition, ultimately. And I think General, uh, General Mattis was right. Um, but I also think the opposite is true. To strengthen the State Department and American diplomatic and economic influence, we need a large defense budget. These are mutually, mutually reinforcing. In the vivid image of the um, strategist uh, Philip Bobbitt, force and diplomacy function like the two blades of a scissors. They need to go together. Uh, if you only have one, you don't have a functioning scissors. So what does this look like in practice? I'll just list a few specific benefits we see um, from strong military, often without firing a shot. It preserves the open lanes of global commerce and finance for the American economy. It induces fence-sitting countries to lean more our way rather than towards our, our adversaries. It helps to secure and preserve peace treaties, spurs our allies to spend more on their own defense, it strengthens our economic negotiating posture with allies, it strengthens our negotiating posture with our adversaries, it makes us more attractive to potential allies and partners, it provides new channels for diplomatic leverage and intelligence collection, it helps promote and strengthen democracy and human rights, and improves humanitarian relief operations and enhances our public diplomacy. And in my written testimony, I have uh, a number of historical examples backing up each of, those, each of those points. So finally, the prevailing international order, so successful in promoting America's prosperity and preventing a great power war over the last 75 years, now faces an unprecedented combination of challenges and an uncertain future. What is certain, however, is that any hopes of reforming and preserving this order in alignment with America's interests will depend in part on maintaining a strong national defense and integrating that with our diplomatic and economic goals. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Brands? Chairman Thornberry, uh, Congresswoman Davis, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for having me here. Uh, with the proviso that my remarks reflect only my personal views, let me just briefly offer a handful of analytical points about our subject uh, and then three recommendations for Congress. Uh, the first point is that the international order as we know it depends on American leadership. Uh, the absence of great power war since 1945, the dramatic growth of American and global prosperity, the fact that the number of democracies in the world has grown tenfold since World War II, none of these things happen naturally. They happen in large part because the United States used every tool in its toolbox to, to bring them about. The United States anchored military alliances uh, and deterred aggression in key regions. Uh, it led an open global trading order. It encouraged the survival and spread of democracy. Uh, it catalyzed collective action in addressing key global challenges. Had the United States not played this role, there would be no liberal international order. Uh, second, American leadership in turn depends on American military superiority. Since World War II, the United States has had a military second to none. Uh, after the Cold War, the United States had unrivaled military superiority. Uh, and this is simply because the world is a nasty place, and so a country that cannot defend its interests by force if necessary, will eventually see those interests imperiled. Uh, it's not simply alliance guarantees alone that, that keep the peace in Europe or East Asia, for instance. The United States has to have the usable military power to make those guarantees credible. Uh, and at numerous points during the post-war era, in the Korean War, in the Persian Gulf War, uh, and in other instances, the United States did have to use force to defeat aggression that might have severely destabilized uh, international politics. A third point is that U.S. military superiority benefits other aspects of statecraft. Uh, one reason U.S. economic statecraft has succeeded in forging a prosperous global economy is that U.S. military power has provided the geopolitical stability and the freedom of the global commons on which that economy depends. Uh, in the same vein, the United States gets better trade deals because of its military power. Uh, to give one example, when America and the European Union were both negotiating free trade agreements with South Korea, the United States got better terms because South Korea valued American military protection. Uh, and looking beyond economic statecraft, U.S. military power assists critical diplomatic goals such as nuclear nonproliferation because it provides the reassurance that allows allies such as Japan, Germany, and South Korea to forego nuclear weapons. A fourth point is that America needs a vast military superiority, not a marginal superiority, to preserve its interests. Uh, this is in part because the best way to deter wars is to convince rivals that they cannot win them. It's also because the United States has global responsibilities. Russia may be able to concentrate its forces in Eastern Europe. China can concentrate its forces uh, opposite Taiwan. The United States does not have that luxury because it faces multiple challengers in multiple regions simultaneously. And so it is not enough for the United States to have the world's 
strongest military and must have the world's strongest military by far. Uh, a fifth point is that today U.S. military superiority is being eroded by developments at home and abroad. Uh, the most serious challenge comes from the major power rivals that Dr. Inboden mentioned, uh, China and Russia. These countries have conducted sustained military buildups that are meant to offset U.S. advantages, to deny us access to Eastern Europe and the Western Pacific, uh, and to allow these revisionist states to project power globally. Uh, and as a result of this, regional military balances have shifted dramatically. Chinese or Russian leaders might think that they could win a short war against America in the Baltic or then the Taiwan Strait. Uh, and of course, the United States faces intensifying military threats from Iran and North Korea, as well as continuing dangers from terrorist groups. At the same time, the United States has uh, disinvested in defense over the past decade. Real dollar defense spending declined significantly after 2010, notwithstanding uh, the, the plus up from BBA 18. Uh, and the combination of that decline and continuing budgetary instability has had severe impacts on readiness, uh, modernization, and force structure alike. Uh, all told, the United States has less military capability today relative to the threats it faces than at any time in decades. Uh, sixth, uh, as U.S. military advantages erode, the international order will also erode. If Russian or Chinese leaders think they can win a conflict with America and its allies, they will be tempted to behave more aggressively. If we can no longer project decisive power in the Middle East, Iran and terrorist groups will have freer reign in that region. And as U.S. military superiority is diminished, uh, American competitors will feel empowered to challenge us across the full range of economic, diplomatic, and security issues. Uh, with this in mind, here are three recommendations for Congress. First, uh, scrutinize closely the national defense strategy and the national military strategy, both of which were finalized this year. Uh, these documents outline how DOD will protect U.S. interests amid intensifying competition, uh, and I would urge Congress to closely examine whether DOD has a, a realistic and unified approach to doing so. Uh, second, prioritize long-term budgetary growth and stability. Uh, the budget increases due to, to BBA 2018 are welcome, but if defense spending flattens out after FY19, DOD will not be able to do uh, badly needed nuclear and conventional modernization simultaneously. It will not be able to repair accumulated readiness problems. It will not be able to sustain America's ability to project power. So sustained growth in defense spending is critical, uh, as is ensuring that funds are provided in stable and reliable fashion. Uh, third and finally, uh, remember that military power is not enough. Uh, threats like Russian information warfare and Chinese economic coercion are largely non-military in nature. Gray zone conflict reaches across multiple dimensions of statecraft and is meant to shift the status quo without provoking a U.S. military response. Uh, and so even as the United States rebuilds its military advantages, it must also strengthen and better integrate the non-military tools of national power. Uh, and here Congress can use its oversight authority to encourage whole of government approaches and ensure that there is balance among the tools of American statecraft. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you both. Henry Kissinger says, this is a time where we have more information available to us than any people in history, and yet it's harder to have perspective than it's ever been. And I think both of y'all have helped provide some, some perspective. Um, Dr. Brands, one of your statements really stood out to me. The United States has less military capability relative to the threats it faces than at any time in decades. Um, let me first ask, Dr. Inboden, do you agree uh, that compared to what we face, what our advantage is less than any time in decades? Uh, yes, I would agree with Dr. Brands on that. I mean, perhaps a partial modification would be the 1970s were not very good for our posture vis-a-vis -vis the Soviets as well. But, yeah. And so, Dr. Brands, you, one of the, uh, another point you said, we need a vast su superiority, not just a little bit, but a vast. But it sounds to me like the, this statement that we have less capability relative to threats is also saying we don't have the sort of vast significant, I would say, uh, superiority that we need. Is that right? Yes, I think that's right. I, I think we are uh, headed toward a position of, of what might be called strategic insolvency, where we simply don't have the means that we require to achieve all of our ends. And I would just point specifically uh, to, to studies, unclassified studies, which have shown that the United States would have enormous difficulty upholding its alliance guarantees in the Baltic, for instance, or in defending Taiwan from a determined Chinese attack. 
Well, I, I just want to ask then, uh, again, kind of the so what question. So one of the statements in your testimony is, as U.S. military advantages erode, the international order will erode. I would like for both of you to, say, to explain to the average American why he or she should care. Uh, why does that matter? if the international order that we have built in the last 70 years erodes? Why don't we just let other people go tend to their own problems? Why, why does it matter to our lives uh, as we're trying to take care of our families and so forth? Dr. Rimbaud? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, when I travel around uh, our uh, respective home state of Texas giving talks to you know, average Texans about American foreign policy, this question does, does come up a lot. And the way I try to put it is uh, the world is a pretty rough neighborhood, and if the United States is not the strongest guy in the block and steps back from that, somebody else will step in. Uh, we may think as Americans it'd be nice if we could just sort of step back and let the other countries take care of their own business, but unfortunately a number of those other countries, such as China and Russia, have uh, much worse intentions, much more malevolent intentions for, for the neighborhood. Um, so we can't expect the neighborhood's going to be uh, peaceful if we, if we let some other strong men come in. So if I'm living in Amarillo, Texas, why do I care if China is the dominant power in East Asia? Well, if you're living in uh, Amarillo, Texas, you're going to have a couple concerns. One is just the fact that if we don't deter the, uh, their aggression over there, it could well come to our home shores. Um, and again, this is where a troubling but vivid historical analogy is the 1930s, when the United States thought that we could just uh, you know, uh, protect ourselves behind the security of two, two oceans uh, and let those problems in Asia and let those problems in Europe take care of themselves. We saw with Pearl Harbor that those problems will come over here. Uh, in a different way, the 9-11 attacks also showed us that problems in one corner of the world can come and hurt us, hurt us elsewhere. Of course, more particularly for Amarillo, I know a lot of the farmers and ranchers in the panhandle uh, depend on uh, open sea lanes, uh, an open maritime order for, for exports. Uh, and uh, again, we've taken those for granted under underwritten by American security the, the last 60, 70 years. Uh, but if we cede that to China, uh, and if China decides that the, China, you know, the PLA Navy wants to dominate the, uh, the open sea order rather than the United States, uh, that gives China a chokehold on those markets and could be, you know, really hurt the pocketbook of, uh, of uh, farmers and ranchers in your district. Dr. Brands, why should the average American care? Just, just to build on something that uh, Dr. Nvoden said, uh, we, we've become used to living in a world that is relatively peaceful, uh, in which Americans can trade freely and enjoy the benefits of, of global commerce. Uh, that, that is not the normal state of affairs in the world. That was not the normal state of affairs in the world prior to 1945. It's become the state of affairs in the world because of the extraordinary exertions that the United States and its friends and allies have made over the past uh, 70 years or, or so. But if, if we were unable or unwilling to make those exertions, I think we would see the world revert to a more normal state, a more competitive state, a, a state in which uh, more aggressive countries like Russia or China would try to impose their own rules on the world or on, on parts thereof. And to give a very concrete example of how this would matter to Americans, uh, imagine a world in which China has established, fully established a chokehold on the South China Sea and all of the maritime commerce that goes through there, which is a large portion of the world's maritime commerce. A significant portion of American trade flows through the South China Sea. Are we really confident that the Chinese, uh, which, which have acted in a fairly protectionist and mercantilist fashion for decades, would uphold freedom of the seas and freedom of the commons in the same way that we have? Are we really confident that they would not try uh, to use their military control of the area for economic benefit in a way that would disadvantage American exporters, uh, I would not be confident about that. I wouldn't either. Ms. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, thank you both for, for being here. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about some of the more unconventional strategies that China and particularly Russia engage in. We know that <clears throat> they the psychocultural strategies have really been integrated into their overall wartime strategy. And that's something, in fact, I think probably we would all agree that the United States has more difficulties with, um, particularly as, as a democracy. And I wonder whether you um, could comment then on what capabilities or resiliency the United States needs, the military actually needs, 
to counter those kinds of unconventional strategies. Uh, thank you very much, Congresswoman. It's an excellent question and uh, you know, something that Dr. Brands and I have been given a lot of thought to and a number of other uh, strategic thinkers as, as well. Um, this is where I'd first go back to um, some of the points you made in your opening statement about the other elements of national power having a key role to play here, diplomacy, uh, ec ec econ economic power, trade, intelligence as well. Um, so before coming back to uh, the Pentagon in particular, um, I do think that because we're in this new era of information warfare, uh, we may need to think about reconstituting that part of our government, uh, maybe bring back an updated 21st century version of the United States Information Agency, uh, which did so much during the Cold War to counter Soviet misinformation uh, and to put a more positive message of, of the United States out, out, out there as well. Uh, some of those capabilities, I do think, need to be under the, the, Pentagon, the Pentagon as well, but it might need to, um, if we do a whole new agency like that, uh, um, that might might need to be might, might need to be separate. Uh, uh, likewise, um, I do think the Pentagon uh, needs to certainly upgrade its cyber capabilities, uh, as we're seeing. You know, the Chinese pursuing this, uh, to use Kissinger's phrase, salami slicing salami slicing strategy. Of, uh, of some incremental gains, not necessarily overt, overt uses of overt uses of force, and then asymmetric advantages against us. You know, they're not trying to build you know 14 or 15 aircraft carriers to directly counter ours, but rather uh, whether it's their their cyber uh, their their cyber capabilities to uh, disrupt our command and control, their anti ship missiles, uh, think, think, things like that. Um, but returning to how American power is used, I do think it really needs to be a, an integrated effort where the Pentagon is going to play an absolutely uh, essential but not fully sufficient role. And we need to get the, the State Department and the other agencies in, in the fight as well, if you will. Mm -hmm. Dr. Brands? I would largely agree with that. I would just open with the, the broad comment that uh, while we have uh, a defense strategy, while we have military strategy, I'm not sure that we have national strategies for competition short of war. Uh, and in part, that is because the sort of competition short of war that we're seeing today occurs across jurisdictional boundaries within the U.S. government, uh, to say nothing of, of occurring across sort of jurisdictional boundaries internationally. And, and so, uh, it may be that we, uh, in addition to needing particular tools, need uh, additional ways of, of integrating the efforts of, of various pieces of the U.S. government to make sure that we're all moving in the same direction in addressing these, these challenges. Uh, I, would, I would agree uh, on the centrality of the, the cyber realm uh, in, in this respect. The, the only thing I would add here is that uh, while, while I'm not an expert on cyber, my understanding is that the challenges we face in the cyber realm are as much a, an issue of authorities uh, and rules as they are of capabilities. In the sense that I, you know, my understanding is that our cyber capabilities are, are quite good, uh, but that we are, are only beginning to grapple with the question of, of how those capabilities might be used in either a peacetime or a wartime context to protect our interests. And I, I think the DOD cyber <coughs> strategy that was released just recently is a useful step in the right direction. Uh. Can, can I add, yeah, so yeah. one additional thought on this um, is this is where I think America's security assistance programs run by the Pentagon uh, in tandem with the State Department can play a really essential role because our country has an asymmetric advantage with our values, with our democratic values. And uh, those are quite attractive to a lot of other citizens, especially those living in uh, autocratic, repressive countries such as, such as China and Russia. And uh, particularly the role our security assistance has played in promoting civilian control of the military, rule of law, um, non-combatant immunity as a standard for, for use, use, using force. Uh, that's one reason why we've, you know, our growing web of allies and, and partners in the Asia Pacific have been so repelled by China and, and have been drawn towards us. It's not just our strength, it's also our, our values. Yeah. And again, a lot of that is done by the State Department, but the Pentagon has a really key role to play in upholding those as well. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I might just add I was going to follow up with their vulnerabilities and whether we're actually leveraging them as much as we could or should uh, in the realm of free expression and other areas, again, uh, that reflect our values. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Mitchell. Okay. I'll just yell. Thank you. Sorry, gentlemen. 
Dr. Brands, you had, in your three recommendations, you refer to the Defense Department uh, and their efforts to protect U.S. interests that might intensify in conflict. We, that we need to review uh, those plans and ensure they're realistic. Uh, my guess is you've already done that to some extent. Do you have specific areas of concern or questions whether or not, in fact, uh, those they are realistic? Any, any feedback for the committee? I would just flag two areas uh, in particular with respect to the national defense strategy. And in general, I think the national defense strategy is, is a very good document. I think it properly orients uh, the Department of Defense toward uh, major power competition. I, I think it properly flags the importance of U.S. alliances and partnerships, and I, th I think it properly emphasizes issues of readiness and, and lethality. Uh, I, I have a couple of concerns about the how of that document. Uh, one is, I, I think there is a question about whether the strategy that is laid out in that document is in fact ambitious enough. Uh, in some ways it is a step back from the two-war strategy that the United States has had in one form or another essentially since the end of the Cold War. Uh, and, and it essentially says that uh, if we have to fight in one region, we will be capable of deterring, uh, but not necessarily prevailing in, an, in another region. And so I think it's important to know precisely what is meant by that and precisely what level of risk we would be taking uh, in the Middle East, for instance, if we uh, found ourselves in a conflict in East Asia. Let me ask you a question about that. Um, doesn't part of the problem come with defining what a war is at this point in time? You reference a short-term conflict in the, in the South China Sea versus the extended engagement we've had in the Middle East. I mean, those are dramatically different uh, scenarios, correct? Uh, ab absolutely. And, and I think the, the other challenge we face is that um, when we talked about two major regional contingencies during the 1990s, we were talking about most likely a war against North Korea, uh, nearly simultaneous with a war against Iraq. Some of the conflicts we're talking about today would be of an entirely <coughs> different magnitude. If the United States had to fight a conflict against Russia or against China, these would be conflicts with countries that are major powers in their own right. They have their own precision strike complexes. They both possess nuclear weapons and a, and a range of advanced capabilities. And so these, these conflicts would consume a much larger portion of our force than the conflicts to which we became, became accustomed during the, the 1990s or the 2000s. One more quick question up front, and I do want to change to another topic, but uh, don't you believe that if we, end up, if we end up facing a conflict with either China or Russia, more often than not, we end up doing that via surrogates and not necessarily with the nation state itself? I think both of those are, are unfortunately realistic possibilities. And so it's, it's entirely possible, for instance, that the United States could find itself uh, wrapped up in a conflict with Russian proxies in the Middle East, for instance. Sure. Um, but, but I think that we, we can't ignore the danger that the United States might come into, uh, whether by deliberate Russian action or miscalculation, a more traditional state-on-state -state conflict involving our easternmost NATO allies, so that we might come into a uh, significant state-on-state uh, -state conflict with China involving Taiwan or the East China Sea or the South China Sea. Let me change topics in the couple minute and a half I have left. Uh, you both talked in one sense or another about military and, and statecraft or statecraft as being parts of a scissors. Um, I understand in terms of engagement in countries, military aid, foreign, you know, foreign aid. I have constituents ask why it is that we're providing significant foreign aid to some countries that alleged to be friendly, but become a, a source of more than moderate conflict. How do we draw the, or, or concern, let's put it that way, we can name a few today if you'd like. Uh, how do we draw some distinction and deal with those countries that really aren't on board, but we end up in one manner or another putting a whole lot of money out the door for them? Uh, I'll take a quick stab at that, Congressman Mitchell. And again, this is without defending every last dimension of American uh, assistance <laughs> programs. So I, you know, but, but uh, in general, as I often even tell my students, uh, policy making is not the art of choosing a good policy from a bad one. It's about choosing a bad policy from a worse one. Um, and oftentimes, uh, those aid programs, uh, <laughs> as frustrating as they can be, as, as misplaced as it may be, uh, are still giving us some leverage and preventing a bad situation from from becoming worse. And we often do it because it's our, in our interest. Uh, rather than necessarily a benevolent act for, for the others. I would just provide one example of that, which is that the United States has, has engaged significantly with the Colombian military over the past uh, two decades, e even as that, that military and the Colombian government has had uh, some struggles with its approach to human rights. But I think that anyone who's looked at this closely would argue that the leverage we get through that engagement allows us to improve Colombian performance on human rights issues 
whereas we would not have that ability if we didn't have these assistance programs. Thank you, gentlemen. A lot of other questions, but I'll yield back. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. O'Halloran. Sorry, technical difficulties. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for either one of you, uh, if we are uh, to embrace the whole of government approach uh, to ensuring a strong military, how do current and proposed cuts to agencies like the State Department and the Department of Education and others affect the ability to maintain a strong military? Uh, uh, Congressman O'Hara, and I'll take a shot at that one first. Um, I, I think, uh, per, particularly on the State Department and, and USAID, uh, I think those cuts are damaging. I reference back to my favorable citation of um, then General, now Secretary Mattis's quote about, uh, you know, if we make those cuts, he's going to have to buy more more ammunition at the at, at, at the at the Pentagon. Uh, so uh, I'm not here to tell an exact number of what they what they all should be, but I do think that overall the United States underinvests in our our international power and influence and for, force projection across those agencies. I think there's simply no way of robbing Peter to pay Paul in, in this respect. Uh, you have to think of force and diplomacy as being interdependent, and if you're skimping on either one, uh, you're, you're, going to, you're going to suffer the consequences of it. And I would just offer a couple of examples. I, I think that if we're talking about the State Department in particular, uh, the State Department possesses immense country and regional expertise that, that can be useful in, in, in charting American foreign policy and, and considering what the best military strategy might be in a given uh, context. Uh, the State Department possesses the intellectual capital that's necessary to translate American military leverage into diplomatic results at the negotiating table. And so these things really do go together in a cohesive whole. Uh, it appears China is expressing a desire to uh, extend its power uh, everywhere. But in particular, I'm concerned about uh, Africa. And as we pull out of certain locations, they move in quickly and now into South America. What uh, long-term implications is that going to mean uh, to our, both our economy because of those natural resources and, and markets that are in Africa and to our uh, ability to keep sea lanes open? Uh, a, uh, I think a growing concern, which I'm sure uh, you know, many of the members of the committee are aware of, is, um, is China's uh, growing military presence in Djibouti, um, very clear, you know, right there on the Red Sea, close to the Suez Canal uh, choke, choke point. So uh, I think we were perhaps, uh, when they first showed up there about a decade ago, we were perhaps a little lackadaisical about it, and now see that um, that, that gives them some real leverage, uh, uh, both going into the African interior, but especially in one of the two most important uh, you know, sea lane choke points in, in the globe. Uh, but uh, likewise, there's also um, the method of China's economic engagement with Africa and South America it does seem to be mercantilist, does seem to be undermining rule of law, it does seem to be promoting corruption, uh, and uh, I think reversing some of the hard-won gains uh, in those continents for economic growth and, and good governance. But at the same time, they, uh, sometimes the Chinese are doing it in ways that are producing antibodies and local resentments. It's an opportunity for American engagement. Um, but in other ways, some of those countries feel kind of abandoned by the United States and are, are rushing into Beijing's, Beijing's embrace. So it's a real concern. Just focusing on the Western Hemisphere, uh, while, while most Chinese engagement at this point is, is diplomatic and economic, we have seen growing Chinese military engagement as, as well and ties to the region's military. Uh, the construction of, of facilities that could have military applications uh, in Argentina and so over the long term, I, I worry that China might try essentially to do what the Soviet Union did during the Cold War in terms of gaining leverage on the United States by establishing a military presence uh, within the Western Hemisphere. Uh, just building on something that Dr. Inboden said, uh, while we are certainly uh, dealing with the consequences of increased Chinese engagement in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Latin America, the, the best antidote to that is, is our own engagement rather than necessarily trying to frustrate China's. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield. Dr. Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd actually like to do a sort of a different spin on the question that the Chairman asked at the beginning to Dr. Imboden, which is to say, what would, when it, as it pertains to the role of allies specifically, which we've had a robust debate in the last election cycle about, what would be your elevator pitch, not only to Texans, but also to Northeast Wisconsinites, about the value that allies play in this U.S.-led global order? 
So the, uh, the, the role, role of allies, uh, this is where I'd, I'd make a couple of historical and a couple of practical points. The first one I alluded to, alluded to earlier is the United States is almost unique in world history. When you look at uh, previous uh, global great powers, global empires, and having the allies that we do. And when Americans, uh, skeptical of allies, first hear that, they think, okay, these are more burdens we've taken on. But allies are also, these are countries that have sworn themselves and their young men and women to die on behalf of Americans, to stand alongside us and, and, and fight there. So that, that's something unique. Other countries don't necessarily have this. Uh, then I would point to uh, one reason we know our allies are such a source of strength is they drive Russia and China crazy. That's why Russia and China are spending so much time trying to peel our allies off from us. The third point I would make, especially when the burden sharing question comes up and whether our allies are doing enough for their defense, is that's a concern I share. Um, I'm glad to see a number of our allies finally increasing their defense commitments. But oftentimes, and this is less appreciated, the best way for us to get our allies to step up their defense spending is to maintain and increase our defense spending. Great example is Japan in the 1980s and the Reagan administration. Uh, we are having acute frustrations with Japan as essentially a free rider on the American security umbrella. They were tremendously underfunding their, their defense forces. But then once Reagan comes into office, dramatically increases the American defense budget. That gave him leverage to go to Prime Minister Nakasone, and Nakasone in turn took great political risk and dramatically increased defan Japan's defense budget and their maritime defense perimeter as well. So I think that's a case study. When we do more, our allies will step up and do more as well. So in that dangerous neighborhood you referenced earlier, it helps to have friends that have your back. Exactly. We, we, we can never have enough friends. Uh, Dr. Brands, it, it, we've invoked uh, Henry Kissinger at various points in this hearing, but it almost sounds like we're making a critique of a Kissingerian form of realism, right? It seems like both of your testimonies support more of a unipolar world. I mean, to the extent that's true, push back on that if that's not true at all. And if it is, however, if it's not stable to arrive at a balance of power between Russia and China, or Russia, uh, I mean, uh, America and China, or America, China, and Russia, some sort of bipolar, multipolar world. What is it that the structural realists are missing about the current state of play in the world? Uh, so I would broadly agree with the statement that, that a unipolar world brings stability that a multipolar world would not, because what it essentially allows uh, the United States to do is to sit on the sources of conflict in the international system. And so we can maintain those alliances in regions like Europe and East Asia that suppress uh, historical antagonisms between, say, Japan and its neighbors. Uh, we can prevent uh, countries from destabilizing the system by pursuing uh, means of aggression. We can uh, check uh, phenomena like nuclear proliferation that could make the world much, much more dangerous. And so the fact that we are willing to, to pay a little bit more in terms of maintaining the system means that we actually get a very good deal in the long run because the world as a whole is much more congenial to our interests than to our values. I'm running out of time, but is there, given that we don't have infinite resources, the world is very dangerous, is there anywhere you think we can play a little bit of money ball? Or we may be able to reduce our investment and actually get more in the process? Uh, I think uh, j just as a matter of, of reality, we're probably headed toward the period in which uh, we will be taking more of a light footprint approach in, in the greater Middle East. But I think it would, be, it would be a mistake to think that we can somehow disinvest from that region entirely. Uh, we still have forces operating in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Syria, we still face significant threats from terrorist groups, and we've seen that when we pull back, those threats get bigger, we still face the threat from Iran. And so we may have to shift our prioritization of various regions, but we will not be able to disengage fully in a military or other sense from the Middle East. Dr. Imboden, quickly. I would agree with Dr. Brands. I mean, too often the debates uh, are put as an all or nothing. We're either entirely in the Middle East and over leveraged there, or we're entirely out, uh, likewise with Asia, Asia or Europe. So I do think a recalibration is in, in order, perhaps a half step back from the Middle East and South Asia compared to where we were 10 years ago. But as we saw with um, our complete pullout of Iraq in 2011 and then the commensurate rise of the Islamic State, uh, we way overdid it there. Um, and so sometimes even a, you know, a residual leave behind force in a key region can play exponentially better benefits for us as a preventive. Uh, thank you both. Mr. Chairman, I know when you refer to me as Dr. Gallagher, you're making fun of my failed academic career, but I'll take it nonetheless. It is only appropriate if Dr. Gallagher was going to question Dr. Brands and Dr. Inboden that you all be, uh, you know, on a similar page there. Ranking member. Okay. Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank both doctors, and we appreciate Dr. Gallagher being here, too. And um, as, uh, for the last 70 years, America has maintained its values and freedom 
by upholding the security umbrella for the rest of the world. During that time, we've witnessed Western Europe's revival. We've seen uh, Asia's economic boom. We've seen the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the result is that we have, with deliberation of an establishment of democratic governments in Central and Eastern Europe, also in Central Asia, uh, we now see uh, the largest number of nations uh, in the history of the world which have free and democratic um, uh, governments uh, and institutions. To me, it's very exciting, uh, and it also relates, as you cited, um, global commerce, opportunity that we've never really had before. Whether through soft or hard power, diplomatic peace, when executed through American military strength, has continued to provide an effective countermeasure against adversaries. The strength is also reinforced by the defense industrial base, which continues to innovate, support the global economy, and provide confidence for our warfighters in cutting-edge technology. With that in mind, as Congress continues to uh, invest effectively, and we'll be voting later today uh, with the leadership of Chairman Mac Thornberry for the first time in 22 years to uh, actually fund the military within the fiscal year. Uh, what an extraordinary achievement. Uh, with the investment industrial base, um, what, how can we maintain uh, our uh, competitive edge uh, when intellectual property theft is so fragile within the military uh, industry? And I, I, either one of you can answer. Uh, so, so I think that the uh, one of the benefits of increased investment in defense is, is that it will help sustain the industrial base that, that you talked about. And so one of the, the negative effects of, of the past, of the period since 2010, is that we've lost, uh, I think, around 10,000 prime defense vendors simply because there, there isn't uh, sufficient regularity or size of funding to, to sustain them. Uh, and so it, it's worth remembering that uh, if, we, if we are looking at a, a point where we might have to significantly mobilize the nation for a conflict, we need to have that industrial base to, to draw on. And I think that that also involves uh, taking stronger protections for intellectual property and, and pushing back against industrial espionage and other practices that our adversaries ha have taken to undermine our industrial base. I would, uh, I would add to that, uh, thinking about both, both China and Europe, uh, the, the first is, while I'm generally a pretty committed free trader, I'm, I'm a supportive of some of the, uh, the current administration's uh, efforts to really go after China on its IPR, theft and forced technology transfer, and a number of other things. However, going back to my comments about allies, I worry that we are taking this fight on with one hand tied behind our back because we have our withdrawal from TPP, uh, some of the other tensions with a number of our allies. I think we'd have a more effective uh, uh, way of uh, addressing China's uh, uh, malevolence in this area if we were doing it with a united, broad, multilateral front. Uh, then the second point would be when we are having this issue with the Soviet pipeline and a number of our European uh, allies in, in the Cold War sharing sensitive technology with the Soviets, um, again, sometimes you have to address that asymmetrically. And the way we were bringing our European allies on board was when we deployed the intermediate, intermediate range nuclear forces in Europe, uh, enhanced their sense of security, and that gave them uh, a little bit more of a comfort level to then stop sharing so much technology with the Soviets. Thank you very much. And I, uh, additionally, uh, the challenge of regularity, uh, hopefully Chairman Thornberry is going to get that corrected. Uh, and then, um, but another challenge we have is the uh, lengthy and oftentimes difficult acquisition process that stunts the growth of uh, our ability to provide the best equipment uh, to our military personnel. What, what solution do you have? Uh, with the proviso that I, I'm not an expert on, on the acquisitions process, I, I think what we have discovered is that uh, the, the current DOD acquisitions process, which places a premium on developing uh, exquisite systems over a period of 15 to 20 years, is probably not well suited to, to the era of rapid innovation and intense competition into which we are entering. And so it, I think it's likely we will need to, to open the aperture, perhaps modestly, to allow scope for acquisitions processes that can move faster and perhaps take a little bit more risk as, as the price of a higher level of innovation. I would agree with Dr. Brands. And thank you. And again, with the uh, ever-changing technology, uh, any recommendations you have on how this can be uh, handled would be very appreciated. Thank you very much for being here today. Mr. Byrne. Thank you. I think a lot about the labor workforce that we have to depend upon 
to make the stuff that we use um, to protect the country. I used to run the two-year college system in Alabama and was the chair of the Workforce Planning Council. And one of the things we had to do was to get the workforce ready to build a brand new class of Navy ship. So we had, we had to create that expertise from scratch. So one of the things that's concerned me is that we get a labor force up and trained to create a certain weapon system. And then we say, okay, now we're gonna shift to another and we've got a hiatus here of a couple of years. And then that workforce is let go and then we got to go hunt up a new workforce, get them trained, take the time to get them to the level of expertise that they can do the work. Any thoughts about what we could do about that? Well, uh, again, that's getting a little uh, uh, far outside my, my realm of expertise, but I'll just say that, um, uh, one, this is a problem not just for our, our military uh, industrial base, but also for the, con the country at large, obviously, with, uh, with automation, with some, you know, some of this uh, rapid innovation. And so this gets back to the, you know, the, to use the cliche, the need for a whole of government approach and making sure our education system is preparing people for, you know, 40 years ago is for one or two jobs over the next 40 years. Now it may be for 40 different jobs over the next 40 years. 40 years. Um, but the other thing I would say is uh, stepping back when we look at different windows when we have uh, rather precipitously cut our, our defense uh, spending, uh, whether it was uh, 1945 to 50 right after uh, World War II um, or, the, or the Cold War peace dividend right afterwards, we overcompensated with that and some of the short-term gains we got, uh, whether in you know uh, diminished gov government spending um, or transfer to the private sector, we're soon overtaken by much more costly security challenges, as well as having to go back and reinvest and getting a lot of those assembly lines up and running again. So I think um, being a little more gradual in our changes uh, would be a key. But, but also, I was talking to a company this morning that does things in the aviation industry, and so much of the stuff that they're doing started out as defense, but now it's being used over on the civilian side. So the impact of the defense spending and defense technology on the rest of our lives is pretty significant. We still, we have to have people with that expertise, you know, at different levels. And by the way, I'm a big skeptic about how far automation is going to go to replace a lot of these workers. I, I, think, I think people are being a lot more optimistic about what automation can accomplish than is actually the case. But I, I worry about that workforce. Now, you're right, it's across the board. It's not just in DOD. But I worry that when we make decisions in defense, we don't think about what the consequences are to the workforce and then to the overall economy. We have this sort of up and down cycle. I would just say, I, th I think part of it goes back to the regularity of funding. So the more turbulence we have and, and levels of funding that's provided, the worse it makes the turbulence for the workforce uh, as well. The, the only other thing I would add is that I think what the, the challenges we face today, particularly the challenge from China has highlighted is that there are shortfalls, not just in the way that DOD approaches national security challenges, but the way the country as a whole approaches national security challenges. And I think the Chinese challenge in particular uh, is highlighting the gaps we face in, in STEM education. I think yeah. it's also highlighting the challenges we, we face in getting uh, close productive cooperation with some of the highest innovation uh, parts of the American economy. I'm thinking of Silicon Valley in particular. And, and I don't have easy solutions to either of those two things, but those are two areas that I think both the department and, and people who care about national security more broadly will need to be focused on intensely in the years to come. Well, I don't have any doubt if we make it a focus, just like we did at the Sputnik moment in, in the 50s and when we put a man on the moon, when we focus on something, American ingenuity, American know-how, and just the quality of the American worker, we'll do it. But it's like we don't have our policy act together to know what it is we're trying to do strategically what are we trying to accomplish? And maybe, I hate to say this, maybe China is forcing us to focus on something we should have focused on all along. I would, one other thing I would add on that is the private sector has to step up here as well. And I, uh, I'm, I am concerned about some of the trends we see in Silicon Valley, you know, which is still the main hub of American inno innovation, where, you know, the revolt of the Google employees over any sort of cooperation with DO DOD, uh, and yet relative silence over what seems to be a, a growing Google entree into China and cooperating yeah. on a censored ser search engine. And so, um, uh, so, you know, the Pentagon, I know in the last couple of secretaries has done quite a bit of outreach to Silicon Silicon Valley, but uh, that needs to be reciprocated by the, by the private sector as well to understand that, yeah, they may be Google employees, but they're American citizens as well, and there's a duty there. Yeah. Thank, thank you for both your insight. I yield back. Mr. Smith. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. I apologize for coming in late at uh, meetings downtown this morning. Um, so when you look at the budget, and we have no end of challenges and, and needs to be met, 
where do you think we can save money? Where are we spending money in the budget right now that we shouldn't be um, in order to meet those needs as, as you've defined them? And I understand there can be a <clears throat> hundred different definitions of what our, our priorities are and what it is we need to be in a position to encounter. But as you are counter, as you define them, you know, and you look at the Pentagon right now, and I get the acquisition procurement reform piece, I'm talking more about specific concrete programs. Um, is there a place where we're spending money that doesn't really match up with what the threat environment is going to be going forward? So uh, I think um, you know, we, we sometimes have a tendency to invest in legacy systems that are perhaps less relevant to the conflicts of the future than, than we might like them to be. And, and so uh, without getting into a great deal specific, it, it's, it may if be If I may, if, if, if you don't get into a great deal specific, it, it doesn't do us any good. Well, well <laughs> that's, that's fair enough. But my, my concern is, is simply that um, uh, not being an expert on particular military systems, uh, I, I, would, I would hesitate to, to speak too specifically about it. But I'll give you one, one example. So it may be that um, having a large number of fourth generation fighter aircraft uh, that can actually operate in the more contested environments in East Asia or Eastern Europe, or perhaps even the Middle East in a place like Syria, is not going to do us a great deal of good. It, it could be uh, that there are, are circumstances in which we might not be able to use our carrier fleet, for instance, in a conflict with, with China. And, and so it may be that uh, we need to be putting more money into the technologies of the future, whether it's fifth generation fighters or unmanned uh, underwater and unmanned air vehicles that can bust A2AD bubbles. Uh, than into the legacy systems. But what I would just say there is that even push, even hoping to um, achieve greater capability through innovation requires money. And, and so what we found at the end of the Obama administration was that DOD was doing some very interesting things with new technologies under the offset, uh, under the, the aegis of what was then called the third offset strategy, but did not have sufficient funds to actually develop and field those capabilities. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll first make a comment about something that's outside of the committee's jurisdiction, but I do think it's pretty strong. Uh, before talking about cuts to the DOD budget, I do think we need to talk about the overall United States government budget. And again, by historical comparison, in, in the 1950s, when um, under Eisenhower administration, the Pentagon was about 50% of the federal budget because we didn't have the you know massive domestic entitlements we have now. Right, true. Okay, staff, you one, one, one quick second. And, yeah. and I, I was going there next. Okay. Um, okay. But here, I'm not talking about debt, deficit, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm simply saying the Pentagon was going to spend $720 billion. I'm not mm -hmm. saying the debt. Let's imagine for the moment that we had a balanced budget, even a surplus, as long as we're fantasizing. Um, it is still quite possible that even in that environment, there's money being spent at the Pentagon that shouldn't be being spent. In mm -hmm. fact, I would say it's likely. Um, so that's what I'm asking is, you know, we'll get into the broader debt and deficit question at the okay. moment. I'm simply saying that you both, and I'm sorry I missed it, but um, had your outline of here's our national security strategy, here's the threats we face, here's what we ought to be prepared to do. Mm -hmm. What are we spending money on right now that has more to do with either legacy or loyalty to a program, but that we don't really need to be spending money on based on our national security strategy? So just staying in that lane. Okay, I'll give you three. Um, uh, and, and again, the philosophy behind these is I think the emphasis needs to be on the warfighter, on readiness, on, on f future weapon systems. Uh, so TRICARE, uh, retirements and pensions, and then the DOD civilian workforce. I think there's areas for reform and significant savings and all those, even though they may be politically very difficult. But uh, I think those could free up more resources, again, for the warfighter, for readiness, for new weapon systems. So. And as far as the debt and the deficit are concerned, and I know we, we've heard the statistic before, and it's, it's very true that, you know, prior, you know, in the 50s, we spent a higher percentage of GDP. Um, but that primarily was because we didn't have Medicare and Medicaid. I mean, those are the two, you know, huge programs, uh, which meant that, well, old people died a heck of a lot sooner um, than there otherwise would have. So there is a certain value to Medicare that I think we would all acknowledge. Um, when you look at the debt and the deficit, um, and here I will allow you to bring other things in. Um, you know, $22 trillion, I think it's going to be a trillion dollars this year. Um, how big a threat do you think that is to your view of what the defense budget ought to be? Putting aside for the moment disagreements or whatever, but when you look out and say, okay, this is what we need for defense, 
um, you know, how problematic is it going to be to get there with our debt and deficit where they're at right now? So I would say that um, we don't quite know when the, the crunch will come with respect to the deficit and debt, but, but I'm quite sure that it, that it will come. And at some point, if it's not addressed, it, it will crowd out discretionary spending in, in general if larger and larger shares of the federal budget are going to, to debt service payments, uh, entitlement programs, and other essentially mandatory spending. And, and so if we don't get a handle on the problem at some point, we are going to find that we'll be constrained in, in paying for, for national security. I, I would not necessarily suggest uh, addressing uh, budget deficit challenges uh, by adjusting the DOD budget, but, but I think as, as a general uh, proposition, the idea that it will be crowded out eventually if we don't solve the problem is true. And I'll just add the, uh, the additional threat that, you know, not all debt is created equal, and the, the debt that is held by, say, an adversary like China, uh, you know, I know the economics of this are complicated, but potentially yeah. gives them some more leverage over us than debt held by Americans or by, by our allies. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, to a certain extent, China wants us to pay them back, um, so it, it sort of goes both ways. Um, but when you say that the defense shouldn't be part of the equation, defense is still, I think, 17%. 18% of the total budget. It's, it's a big chunk of it. Um, and if you've got a trillion dollar debt, um, it would still be your vision that as we deal with that, defense should be off the table? Again, I wouldn't say defense off the table entirely. Like I said, I identified a few you know, specific areas as you had, you had requested for potential savings there. But part of it comes back to a, a philosophical uh, conviction about the primary role of government to secure the, the, and provide for the national defense. Um, and so I, that's always going to be an essential for me. And no matter how sort of we may be on you know, reducing the debt or deficit, if that's leaving us vulnerable to, to attack from, from adversaries, uh, then that's going to cause a lot more damage to our, to our country than, than the, the than the debt, but I don't want to be blasé about that at all. Like I said, I gave the historical context, and I'm not at all calling for eliminating Medicare, Medicaid, uh, or Social Security for that matter, but I do think when you look at the trend lines and the growing uh, proportion of the, the, the budget that they are they are occupying, uh, which is only going to continue, um, I do think there's room for substantial re reform there and some potential savings, which might relieve some of the pressure on the, on the defense budget. What about base closure? Do you think base closure could save us significant money, and does it make sense? Uh, yes, I certainly think there's room for that. I mean, my uh, you know first boss in Washington 25 years ago was uh, Sam Nunn, the, then the chairman of the SASC, and you know he was a real pioneer on this. Um, and sometimes the best thing we do need to do for the Defense Department is asking some tough questions and maybe closing some 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 inefficient bases. Uh, but I'm just I don't have the expertise. I'm not equipped here to start identifying which ones uh, which ones no, need no, to be closed. I, I, yeah. No. Right, so. That would be awesome, by the way, if you could do that. If you could save us the time of the commission and just lay it out right now. Um, but uh, thank you very much. I yield back. Let me let me go back to, um, I guess, in some ways, the next step between that conversation between y'all and, and Mr. Smith, because it gets really to kind of the heart of the topic of this hearing. Um, I have, and, and I'll get you both to comment on this, I've come to think of it as a bit of a chicken and egg situation. You have to have a growing economy in order to have the tax revenue to pay for the military. You also have to have a strong military in order to have an economy in a globalized world that is growing. Uh, and so there is a mutual dependency there that I don't think we fully appreciate. Now that's my thesis. And I would be interested if either of you disagree, especially if you disagree or agree or what your reflections are on that. Uh, I, I would fully agree. And again, the, the example I would, I would simply give is that we will not have a prosperous and thriving economy if, if Americans do not have access to global markets because the, the sea lanes are becoming increasingly contested and, and endangered. And that's just a very concrete example of how you can't have one without the other. And I'll, I'll add uh, specifically there, while you're very much affirming your general proposition about the virtuous cycle between a strong national defense and a growing economy, uh, without getting too much into in the defense industrial policy, which is beyond my expertise, not all government spending is created equal. Uh, some of it really does have multiplier effects as investments in the future. Education can be that. I think a lot of our, our, uh, our DOD programs can be that in ways that, say, some of the, the welfare state entitlement programs, for all the good benefits they have, don't necessarily produce the growth benefits. And so even looking at 
Most uh, innovation in the United States has been driven by the private sector, but things like nuclear energy, the, the internet, uh, GPS, uh, a lot of those started off as DOD uh, research programs uh, for you know, the, the defense and security uh, ramifications, but we quickly realized those also have uh, profound private sector applications, which have been incredible drivers of American economic growth. So. Let me ask about uh, an, or touch on another area that we hadn't really touched on uh, so far today, uh, and, and that is I'm always struck by the statistics that show global poverty at an all-time low, about how many people uh, have been lifted out of the lowest level of poverty in fairly recent decades. Now, some people say that's all about technology. Some people say that's all about China's growth, and that's where most of the people come from, you know, et cetera. But I, my question to you all is, uh, these are remarkable statistics. Again, I think we underestimate. What role has the international order that we have enforced played in this rise out of poverty of so many million people in the past few decades? I'll just start by saying, um, Peace, uh, the absence of war, is a great antidote to poverty. I mean, you know, we certainly see historically war is one of the great triggers of poverty, you know, with the, the the death and destruction and uh, and devastation that it that it that it that it causes. And so, insofar as uh, you know, our military has you know preserved the great power of peace for the last seven, 75 years, uh, that in and of itself has you know given say a country like China the opportunity to uh, rather than being fear, fearful of being invaded by its neighbors or being in a regional war to uh, undergo you know tremendous economic reforms and, and development there. But Dr. Brands may have something to add. Uh, my, my understanding of the statistics is that uh, the world as a whole has averaged about 3 to 4 percent growth since the end of the Second World War, uh, which, which doesn't sound that impressive until you compare it to growth in previous periods. And it's about two to three times as high as what average world growth levels had been before that. And I think the reason for that uh, is, is twofold. Is first, we have not had a major global depression uh, since the 1930s, in large part because the United States has played the leading role in managing the international economy and ensuring that, that economic problems, when they do arise, do not snowball in the way that they did uh, in the 19, late 1920s and 1930s. And two, we haven't had a, a global or, or a great power war since 1945, which has traditionally been the sort of thing that, that sets back the international economy by, by many, many uh, steps. And, and so the fact that we have prevented those bad things from happening has had a powerful impact on not just American prosperity, but, but global prosperity. And that, that's in addition to all the work that, that we and our, our allies have done to create a, a global free trade system and sort of move the ball forward on a day-to-day -day basis. If I can add a, a quick thought on that, that because uh, Dr. Brands mentioned our, our alliance system. This is where, when we look at America's allies today, they're, uh, without exception, first world countries with robust developed economies and very, li very little poverty. Um, but on the chicken and egg thing, that wasn't always the case. When we formed our alliance with Japan, with, with, uh, with South Korea, these were tremendously impoverished places. You know, as recently in the 1960s, South Korea had the same per capita excuse me, GDP as, as Ghana, for example. Um, and of course, much credit to the, the South Korean people for you know, their own economic recovery and dynamism there. But the American security umbrella played a, tr played a tremendous role in that, as well as arguably the, you know, the, pre the presence of our, 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 our forces there, you know, some of the positive interactions that, that they had in partnerships they were building with, uh, with the, with the South, South Korean people. Uh, similarly, when you compare West, Germany, uh, West Germany's economic re recovery with East Germany's, uh, or, you know, so I like the Germany and Korea ones because you have a great laboratory there. Common language, common culture, common history, common geography, but one was part of the American alliance system, the other, the other was not. Okay, so both of y'all teach some of the brightest students in this country uh, about these kinds of historical geopolitical issues. Do they understand how unique this period in world history is? Uh, do they take it for granted? I mean, what, what, what is your teaching experience like when you kind of talk about these issues and, and what has been achieved in the last 70 years? Do you get blank faces? Do they, are they proud? How, what's, what's the interaction like? 
Uh, I would say that they are uh, increasingly coming to appreciate how extraordinary the past 75 years have been, uh, in part because they are witnessing the, the way in which the world seems to be growing more dangerous every day. And, and so it, it's uh, easier for them to imagine uh, what a world that was not relatively peaceful, peaceful prosperous, and, and democratic would, would look like. I, I would further add that I think um, hi history is a great teacher here. And, and so to, to the extent that uh, whether when we're dealing with the students at, at Johns Hopkins Sice or at UT or, or with any citizen, uh, the, the more sort of historical sensibility we can provide in terms of uh, demonstrating that the past 75 years have not been the norm in human history, they've been very much the exception, uh, is a way of driving home the points that we've been talking about here. And I'll just uh, add, add to that with a shout out to our wonderful students at the LBJ School and at the University of Texas Austin more broadly. Um, on the one hand, you know, each, each fall when we welcome a new class in, uh, one of the first discussions I have with them is what are their memories of the 9-11 attacks? And 10 years ago, these were very vivid memories. They were in elementary school or junior high or high school at the time. Uh, you know, by, by next year, we'll have the first generation of college freshmen who are all, almost all born after 9-11. Born after and so I'm realizing what used to be a memory we could rely on about our country vulnerability uh, and, and the need for a strong military is now becoming a, a history lesson. But the second uh, thing I've found to my great encouragement is uh, each, uh, each May I take 20 uh, UT undergrads sponsored by the Clement Center over to London for a month of study on the history of the US-UK uh, relationship. And uh, this is very, uh, you know, uh, strong focus on World War II and the Cold War. And we take the students over to Omaha Beach for three days, uh, for, to the D-Day beaches for three days, including the Omaha Beach Cemetery, and having them walk through the Omaha Beach Cemetery and see those 10,000 graves of American soldiers who were their age when they were killed, and see that this was the sacrifice that America made to, to liberate Europe from fascism is very powerful for those students, much more so than any uh, you know, semwinder of a lecture I could give them. Then when we take them to Point Du Hoc, and not just showing them where the Rangers scaled the cliffs, but showing them where President Reagan stood on the 40th anniversary of, uh, of, of D-Day, talking about the importance of Western solidarity against the Soviet Union, talking about how 40 years ago the Germans were our enemy here and now they're our ally in fighting against the, the Soviet Union. That sort of history brings us alive to the students and shows them, I think, the very rich inheritance that they have and that it's now incumbent on them to, to take forward as the emerging generation of American leaders. Well, I wish all our students had that opportunity. Um, I'm struck by the fact, Ms. Davis, that I think it's more than 70 percent of uh, the members of the House were not in office on 9-11. Um, and, you, you, you know, it, it does make a difference if you felt like the planes were coming for us versus uh, uh, a historical memory. Ms. Davis. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your mentioning that because I know that I often say to um, my constituents that I came in in 2001. Uh, obviously, that day is a very incredibly strong memory, and yet we have essentially been involved in the same war that was started after 9-11. So it um, gives you a real sense of um, th that connectedness to that and the fact that, of course, young people today don't have that, will not have that same connection. Uh, I wanted to, to follow up a little bit on, on just what you you've said and, and then... Um, ask another question that you, you've dealt with, but, but perhaps um, can, can expand a little bit. One is, is just this resiliency, um, and, and it's the connectedness to history for young people and the opportunities that we have to build that more. And one area of interest has been for many people, including um, uh, uh, General McChrystal and others, is national service whether you feel that as you see students coming to you today, do you believe that there is something that we as a nation could, should be doing to, be, to instill more sense um, of, of where our country has been and where we wanna go? How, how, and is there one way that you've, or several, that you feel that we really should be pursuing that, even talking about that here in the Armed Services Committee? Well, I would just put in, again, a broad plug for um, 
historical education. And I think, you know, we, we all probably took our, our high school class on U.S. history and found that it ended somewhere around World War II or Vietnam because you never quite get through the entire year. But what that means is that um, students who come through college or even make their way to grad school have uh, not necessarily spent a lot of time thinking about the post-World War II era and what makes it unique and what makes it special and what has made U.S. foreign policy successful during that, that period. And so, so I fear that w without uh, a good historical understanding of that period, we'll continue to struggle to generate support for the policies that are needed to keep the good times going. The, the second point I would just make is that um, I find in dealing with my students that have, they have a very strong urge to, to serve in one way or another. But, uh, and, and this is perhaps a small point, it's, it's become more and more difficult for them to do so over the past 10 to 15 years. And that the, the avenues available to them to say go work for the federal government as a Department of State civil servant, for instance, uh, are harder to find and they are narrower than they were in the past, and so, so I would hope that, that that's something that, that we as a country could address at some point, because we do have a mass of, of very dedicated, very intelligent young people who, who want to serve, but don't necessarily think they have an opportunity to do so. Mm -hmm. Thank you, I actually think we put down government all the time, and that doesn't help them to aspire to that. Thank you. If, uh, if I can echo Dr. Brands, again, I, you know, one of the great joys of my life is when I you know, show up in the classroom and, and see how so many of our students are so eager for service, full stop, you know, for service for meaningful lives. Uh, you know, we're a wealthy enough country, they've now realized that it's not just about acquiring more and more stuff, but about doing something for your fellow, your fellow human beings, and especially for your country. And I would echo Dr. Brands' uh, uh, the frustrations about some of the sclerosis in our civil service and how hard it can be to get into those roles uh, for eager students. On the other hand, uh, if I can be the optimist here, one positive aspect of the post 9-11 era has been the return of ROTC and intelligence community uh, recruitment at a lot of our elite universities, which, you know, in the post-Vietnam era, they would, they'd been shunned for campus for about three decades, including through, you know, the end of the Cold War and when we thought we would have been over that. But it finally seemed to have, you know, one positive side effect of the dreadful tragedy of 9-11 has been a, a return to uh, a lot of our elite universities uh, recovering their own sense of patriotism, of citizenship, of, of welcoming our national security establishments recruitment efforts on those on those campuses. Not at all saying that that's the only way for students to go serve, but, but previously it was hard for universities to be able to talk with sincerity about encouraging national service when you don't even allow ROTC or the CIA or others to recruit on campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And just quickly, is there a better way that we should be organized when it comes to our national strategy? Obviously, the um, we, we make great mention of more interdisciplinary you know, whole of government approaches. And yet, when I think about our trade policies today, particularly, uh, and some other policies, you don't see that they're integrated in such a way that we really recognize the implications um, of, of those. Have you thought about that? Is there some, would there be some other better coordinating way um, to deal with those policies? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, maybe need to bring us back next year for a whole other session on interagency reform, right, that, that old chest But I will say on, on trade policy, it's a good example, right? I mean, uh, we're still a little confused. Is USTR in the lead? Is Treasury in the lead? Is Commerce in the lead? Is the Economic uh, Bureau at, at State in the lead? And so there, when you have, uh, you know, multiple different authority centers or, or a couple of the new positions created at the White House, for example, it can be confusing within our government and certainly confusing for, for foreign counterparts as well. That said, um, I do... Uh, it's almost become this, you know, uh, stale line at, uh, you know, D.C. cocktail parties about we need a Goldwater Nichols for the interagency. And again, I'm second to none in my admiration for Goldwater Nichols, but I think that that's perhaps a little too trite of a rigid template to apply. Uh, and I think um, I would first focus on uh, sort of better coordination within the system that we, that we already have, uh, rather than uh, trying to reinvent it too much, because uh, whatever would, would come next might be a little bit worse if we, if we take it too far. I would just say that um, the interagency process and interagency coordination are difficult by design simply because they, they bring together so many uh, different actors with diverse viewpoints within the U.S. government. And, and so uh, we, we could think about specific uh, institutional or structural reforms that, that might help smooth the process, but, but I think the, the big takeaway for me is that whatever structures uh, or whatever process you have will only function 
uh, if, if they are the subject of uh, commitment to making the process work and commitment to having a, a normal structured process from the very top. And, and with, without that, whatever process you have is destined to fail. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bacon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Joan, for being, here, for, for being here, and I'm sorry for being a little late. I'm on three different committees, so we run around a lot, and, uh, but I wanted to run over here and get a couple questions in. I wanted to ask you a little bit about your thoughts on the triad. We, we, we had some discussions from the ranking member uh, who said if, you know, if they're become the majority that they'd like to go into a dyad or, or, or defund at least a portion of our triad, and, uh, I think targeting ICBMs in particular. I just want, want your thoughts on the importance of the triad. Uh, why should we care? Why should why sh should our constituents care? Thank you. So uh, I, I think that even though we don't think about nuclear deterrence very much, nuclear deterrence is perhaps the most important thing that the Department of, of Defense does in, in the sense that the nuclear danger is something that really is an existential threat to the United States. And, and so my top line point is just that uh, it's worth taking this issue very seriously. With respect to the, the triad in particular, um, I, I understand the urge to try to seek uh, savings by looking at, at the nuclear enterprise, but I would just say there, there are very good reasons why we have a triad in, in the first place. Uh, it provides redundancy. It, it presents basically insuperable targeting difficulties for any adversary that might try to, to mount a disarming uh, first strike. And it gives us insurance uh, against the prospect that, that a major power adversary might try to gain an advantage in the nuclear realm by building up rapidly. And, and when we look out at the world today and we see that the Chinese are modernizing their arsenal quite rapidly, the, the Russians have been modernizing their arsenal for about a dozen years now at a time when, when the United States has not, uh, I think the, the arguments for a triad now are as strong as they have ever been. Thank, oh, go ahead. I would, uh, again, echo everything uh, Dr. Brand said, but uh, you know, two, two other dimensions I would, I would add in, in addition is we also do need to think even be uh, more robust in supporting ballistic missile defense. Um, I know that's not a part of the triad, but the, the defensive component there, going back to President Reagan's vision in 1983, uh, now we're seeing it much more acutely with, um, uh, with threats from North Korea, you know, possibly Iran, depending on how that program uh, con continues to develop or not, because we don't necessarily want to be in the position of the only option being an over overwhelming retaliation, right, if there's a way we could we could uh, deter, stop that. Um, the second reason why I think uh, we need to uh, continue to upgrade and maintain the triad is, uh, going back to discussions about our allies, I worry about an eroding commitment among some of our allies to their own nuclear deterrent, especially the British. Um, and uh, and with po future political uncertainty in the UK and possibly a new government coming in that would, you know, has pledged to eliminate their, their nuclear arsenal, um, you know, all the more important that we're, we're still maintaining and upgrading ours. Well, thank you. I really appreciate your comments on that. I, I'm a big advocate for a triad, and we need a robust deterrence. And to go to a dyad, I think, would be uh, threatening and add risk uh, in, our, in our world environment. Now, some more, a little more in your wheelhouse, perhaps, is Chinese uh, economic growth versus ours. Uh, right now, it depends what you look at. They're about 90% of our GDP, roughly. I don't know. I'd love to, maybe you have better numbers. But if they're growing at 6%, and then like in January 17, we had a 1.2% GDP growth, very stagnant. Now we're 4%. What I worry about in the world is if China surpasses us and grows at 6% versus 2 or 1, whatever it may be, what does our world look like? Their values versus our values. We respect individual freedoms, human rights. Uh, so economic power is, I think, very important if we want to preserve our values in the world and, and have a strong voice. But what, what can you, insights can you add for China versus our economic growth and, and how has that changed in the last year? So I'll just make two comments. Um, one, I think that you know, when, you, when you look at the GDP numbers in a vacuum, particularly if you're looking at the purchasing power parity numbers, they, they look pretty bad. And in fact, at purchasing power parity, China has already surpassed us according to most expectations. But, but if, you, if you take a closer look, I think the numbers look more favorable to us. So if you factor in per capita GDP, which is a critical measure of how much wealth a country can actually extract from the population to pursue geopolitical ends, our per capita GDP is about four times that of China. If, if you look at statistics like inclusive wealth, which try to, to take into uh, account the damage that China is doing to its environment and the long-term economic costs that that, that will take, um, it, things look a little bit better. But, but I would f simply add that uh, this, this issue of rising Chinese economic power drives home the absolute critical importance of maintaining and strengthening our alliance relationships. 
Uh, it's, it's one thing if you are comparing U.S. versus China bilaterally in terms of military power or economic power or any other index of national power. It's an entirely different thing if it's China versus the U.S. and all of its allies in the Asia Pacific. Uh, the, the, these alliances give us uh, enormous strategic, economic, and geopolitical advantages, and, and we need to continue to prioritize them. Uh, I'll just, uh, uh, again, agreeing with everything Dr. Brand said, but adding, adding a little bit there. You know, with the, the caveat that I'm very concerned about the growing threat from China, I do think China will be our primary strategic uh, competitor and adversary for the next, you know, 20 to 50 years probably. That said, we don't want to overdo it, particularly on concerns about the economic front. Uh, in addition to um, some of the different ways of interpreting the numbers you mentioned, they have massive uh, problems with internal economic imbalances. Um, massive internal problems with corruption. Uh, and uh, as Xi Jinping has been trying to consolidate his power based on this kind of implicit social compact that the Communist Party has built with its people since 1979 of if the people will relinquish their political and religious freedoms, we will deliver rising standards of, of living and economic growth. Um, uh, you know, as he's looking at some of the uh, internal economic and corruption challenges they're having, you know, it could be large numbers of Chinese people uh, starting to, to question that, especially as uh, the Chinese surveillance state is becoming more and more pervasive. Uh, I, you know, was uh, telling some uh, fellow scholars the other day as we were talking about this that uh, I think Xi Jinping, as much as he's wary of uh, and somewhat afraid of the United States, he's most afraid of his own people. Uh, and that's where some of China's real internal vul vulnerabilities are. So we don't want to create this, you know, 10,000 foot tall Chinese uh, monolith either. One last question if I have time, Mr. Chairman. Um, good news, we're the largest energy producing nation again. Are we doing enough with our Eastern European allies to help them not become dependent on the Russian gas? I mean, I, that's an area that's been a concern of mine when I travel to Poland, uh, the Baltic states, because uh, I think we've had some successes with Lithuania on this. Well, even some of our own bases in Europe are using Russian gas that could just be turned off. It concerns me. Thank you. I'm concerned too. So, yeah, so no, no, we're not, we're not doing enough. And again, I mentioned earlier uh, in the, here in the historical precedent, this was an issue with our European allies trying to be dependent on the, the Soviet pipeline in the early 1980s. And um, we, you know, right then saw that as a strategic vulnerability. Um, for all the talk about the challenges America faces and a lot of the bad news in the world over the last 10 years, one of the underappreciated really good news stories has been uh, the, the shale boom, our tremendous uh, resurgence as, um, you know, arguably the swing energy producer swing hydrocarbon producer on, on the globe. Uh, and yet we have not thus far been able to leverage that enough uh, to uh, help wean our Eastern European allies off of their reliance on Russian gas. May not be able to entirely, but again, I think just some more diversi diversification there, because Russia is you know, able and willing to use, uh, use that as a weapon, as we've seen with Ukraine and elsewhere. Uh, I, I would agree with everything that Dr. Imboden said. I would, I would just add, I think the, the one bit of good news is my, my understanding of the statistics is that while um, our allies in Eastern Europe and even countries like Germany re retain some dependence on, on Russian energy supplies, the, the, the percentage of their energy supplies that they get from Russia is actually less than it was, say, at the beginning of the post-Cold War era. And so while it's, it's discouraging to see things like Nord Stream 2 um, proceeding, I, I think we should Keep in mind that, that over the long term, there has been some progress in addressing this issue. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you both. Again, uh, as I said at the beginning, I think it's important for us to step back occasionally and take a larger, longer view of things, and, and you all have helped us do that today. So thank you again. Hearing stands adjourned.